Karen Anderson was in a completely different world when a man with a much larger than usual manhood gave her pleasure. She had already experienced several climaxes since she walked into that motel room an hour or so ago, and all of them, in her opinion, were much better than anything she had ever experienced with Kyle, with whom she lived for ten years. Whatever guilt she felt about cheating on her husband was soon eclipsed by a feeling of incredible pleasure. In fact, Karen wasn't even sure why she was doing this. Everything was great between her and Kyle. He always treated her like a queen, doted on her, bought her gifts and flowers on a whim just to say, I love you. And the sex between them was good, although it had died down a bit lately. They had two wonderful children, and overall everything was great. But for some strange reason, she decided to give herself to John. Maybe it was the months he spent in the office, seducing her with his compliments and the sly glances he gave her. Maybe it was the thrill of doing something behind her husband's back. Or maybe it was the gossip she heard about his giant manhood in his pants from the other girls in the office. Perhaps it was all of the above. At first, she was worried about how it would affect her marriage and family, but all of that disappeared when she walked into the room. Now all she cared about was absorbing as much as she could from this man in the short time they would spend together, even if it meant getting pregnant with his child. By this time, all thoughts of Kayla had flown from her mind. There was no longer any feeling of guilt, only the need for another climax. She thought that she would make amends to her ignorant husband. Maybe she would even teach him to do what John did to her. After all, John, the man who was now fucking her unconscious on the bed in that cheap motel room, had made her experience a mind-blowing climax. He fell on the bed next to her, and the two lovers fell asleep in each other's arms, promising each other to repeat the performance. She woke up and looked at the clock on the bedside table next to her. The clock showed 8.30, which gave her enough time to clean up and return home. She told Kyle that she would be working late but would be home by 10.30 at the latest. The motel was only a half hour's drive from her home, so she had plenty of time to get cleaned up and return home to her husband. She looked to the other side of the bed and noticed that John had already left. She didn't remember him leaving and thought it was strange that he went home to his wife without telling her anything. She decided to tell him everything she thought when she saw him at work the next day. She also noticed that his side of the bed looked as if no one had ever been there. Strange, she thought, but decided that he was probably as neat as he was talented. She went into the bathroom, examined herself, and noticed that, other than a slight swelling between her legs, John had left no noticeable marks on her. That was a good thing, she thought, since she didn't want to have to explain any strange bruises or marks on her body. She took a very long shower, using two douches to clean herself up as much as possible. She didn't want to risk delivering John's bodily fluids to Kyle's house, at least not yet. After carefully examining herself, she put her work clothes back on and prepared to leave, taking another quick look around the room to make sure she hadn't forgotten anything. Karen threw down her room key, then looked around to make sure no one she knew could see her. The only person she noticed was a rather strange-looking man in an old-fashioned gray business suit standing on the corner and looking at her. He seemed somehow familiar to her, but she could not remember him. He held a cigarette in one hand and kept the other in his pocket. However, what struck her was the lack of any natural color. He looked like a character straight out of an old black-and-white TV show from the 1960s. She returned to her car, got into it, and noticed that the interior was covered in dust and smelled musty, as if the car had been sitting idle for a long time. It's strange. Just a few hours ago, everything was different, she thought. She rolled down the window to ventilate it and tried to start the car. At first it wouldn't start, but after she pressed the gas pedal a few times, it came to life and black smoke came out of the exhaust pipe. She pressed the gas pedal a few times to make sure the car would start, making a mental note to ask her husband to take a look at it in the morning. She headed home, wondering if Kyle would notice any changes in her. Let's hope he doesn't even notice. She returned home a few minutes before 10 end and saw two strange cars in her driveway. This is strange, she thought. Kylie didn't say anything about having company. The house also seemed a little different to her. 
All the curtains were wrong and the landscaping had been completely changed. Of course, he, Kylie, couldn't do all this in one day, and certainly not without consulting her first, she thought. She double-checked the address to make sure she was at the right house, then parked on the street. Kyle had some explaining to do, she told herself. She got out of the car and went into the house, noticing that everything was wrong. There was strange furniture in the living room. All her photos and precious trinkets were gone, replaced. And to make matters worse, there was an older black couple sitting on the couch looking at her strangely. Who are you people, and why are you in my house? asked Karen. The man stood up and looked at Karen strangely. I'm Al Jorgensen, he said, and this is my wife Amanda, he added, pointing to the attractive woman sitting next to him. Who could you be, miss, and why are you in our house? My name is Karen Anderson, and I have lived in this house with my husband Kyle for the last eight years, she said. I don't understand. What's happening? Miss, I think you might want to leave now, Al said. We bought this house from Mr. Anderson a year ago after his divorce became final. Divorce? Karen asked in shock. What kind of divorce? I was just here this morning with my husband before leaving for work. Al began to approach Karen. Miss, I really think you should leave before I have to call the police. Yes, please call the police, Karen said. Something is going on here, and I intend to get to the bottom of it. This must be one of Kyle's pranks. Al picked up his phone and dialed 911. After speaking to the dispatcher, he hung up and spoke to Karen. The police will be here in a few minutes, he said. You can sit down if you want to wait for them here, he added, motioning for her to sit in the deep chair next to the sofa. Karen sat down, wondering what she should do next. She pulled out her smartphone and suddenly realized that it was dead. This was also strange since she always kept it charged so that Kyle or her children could contact her at any time. Sorry to bother you, but can I please use your phone to call my husband? Asked Karen. Of course, no problem, Al said, handing her his phone. Karen dialed Kyle's number from memory, but received a message saying the number was no longer in use. Distraught, she tried to dial her parents' number, but received the same answer. She also tried to call Kyle's parents, but received a quick busy signal. Dejected and with no choice, she returned the phone to Al. Are you saying that you bought this house a year ago from my husband? She asked Al. He nodded. Yes, we did it, he said. He sold it to us at a very good price and said it was because of a divorce. Did he say anything about why he was getting a divorce? She asked. Amanda spoke. He mentioned something about a cheating slut for a wife, she said, looking at Karen suspiciously. Karen was shocked. How could he have found out about this so soon after her first date with John? Poor guy. I could tell he was heartbroken. And these poor children. I felt so sorry for them. By this time, Karen was already in tears. Her life and marriage had crashed and burned without her even knowing it. Shortly after, a police car with lights flashing pulled up to the house. Two policemen appeared at the door. Al spoke to them first, and then invited them inside. Karen stood up as they walked inside. Please show us some identification, miss, one of the officers said. Karen opened her purse and took out her driver's license. The officer looked at them, then turned to Karen. Is this some kind of joke, ma'am? He asked. This license is empty. What? Karen asked, looking at the driver's license. The laminated card the officer was holding was completely blank. There wasn't even a photograph under the lamination. Do you have any other identification? Asked the officer. I have something in my purse, Karen said. But when Karen opened her purse, she discovered that all her other cards were completely blank. I don't understand, she said. There should be credit cards, an ATM card, my social security card, but they are all empty. Can you at least tell us your name? Asked another officer. Maybe there is something in the system. Of course, said Karen. My name is Karen Anderson, and I live on W. Highland Park Road with my husband, Kyle. I work as a paralegal at the Jenkins Law Firm downtown. Surely someone there can vouch for me. The officers scowled at each other before turning their attention back to Karen. Did you say Karen Anderson, ma'am? Asked the second officer. Yes, I said Karen Anderson. 
It's spelled K-A-R-E-N, she said. Sorry, ma'am, you'll have to come with us to the station so we can confirm your identity, the first officer said. We apologize for intruding on your evening, guys, he said to Al and Amanda. The officers walked Karen to the police car and placed her in the back seat. After locking her inside, one of the police officers walked up to Karen's car and rummaged through her glove compartment, pulling out some documents. They drove in silence to the police station, where Karen was fingerprinted and taken to what appeared to be an interrogation room. Half an hour later, the door opened and a plainclothes detective entered the room with a folder in his hands. He sat down opposite Karen and placed the folder in front of him. He went through all the preliminary procedures, informing her of her rights and assuring her that she was not suspected of any crime. All I want to do is confirm your identity, okay? He asked. Karen nodded. You said your name was Karen Anderson, right? He asked. Yes, she said. And you told our officers that you live at 1501 W Highland Park Road with your husband, Kyle, he added. That's true, she said. You also said that you work at the Jenkins Law Firm as a paralegal, correct? He asked. Yes, that's true, said Karen. We have a little problem here, Mrs. Anderson, the detective said. Let's start with the fact that your fingerprints don't exist. I don't mean they're not in the system. I mean, you don't have fingerprints. It looks like they weren't even removed with acid. They simply don't exist. That's not all. We checked the records for this address and discovered that it was purchased by Al and Amanda Jorgensen a year ago from one Kyle Anderson. According to court records, the house was sold as part of a divorce settlement between Kyle and Karen Anderson, he said. Karen was shocked. What was all this talk about divorce? But I'm still married to my husband. I saw him just this morning. I don't understand how this is possible, she said through tears. Look, miss, I'm just going by what's in the court records. Tell me, please, where were you tonight? Asked the detective. I was at the Gaslight Motel, room 1 to 17, she said quietly. And what were you doing there? He asked. I was, um, with a man, she said looking at the floor. What did you do with this man? Asked the detective. We, um, you know, were fooling around, she said. You had sex, right? He asked. Karen nodded her head. Yes, she said. And can you identify the man you were with? Yes, she said. John Hawkins, my boss at the law firm. I see, said the detective. Have you gotten into the habit of cheating on your husband? Karen looked shocked. No, I do not know. It was the first and last time, I promise, she said. Interesting, said the detective. The file we have on you includes a very detailed report from a local private investigator hired by your ex-husband. According to the private investigator's report, you were seen with Mr. Hawkins numerous times at the same motel over several months. Would you like to reconsider your application? Karen shook her head. No, this is wrong, she said. I went there with him only once, today. The detective sighed and leaned back in his chair, looking at Karen. Miss, it so happens that I know the senior partners of Jenkins. I called this evening and was told that one Karen Anderson and her supervisor, one John Hawkins, were fired almost a year ago for violating the company's anti-adultery policy, he said. But that is not all. He pulled a photograph out of the folder and placed it on the table in front of her. The photo showed a woman lying on a hotel bed, her eyes open and her face gray. The woman looked exactly like Karen and, to make matters worse, she was wearing the exact same outfit as Karen. Her eyes widened and she raised her hand to her mouth in shock. This photograph was taken about three months ago, miss, the detective said. According to responding officers, Karen Anderson of 1501 W Highland Park Road was found dead in room 117 of the Gaslight Motel three months ago. An autopsy revealed that Mrs. Anderson died from an overdose of sleeping pills, apparently taken with large quantities of alcohol. So, miss, can you please explain to me how it is that a woman who looks and dresses exactly like the woman found dead in a motel room three months ago is now walking around my property? He asked. And how did it happen that you just ended up in the same room in which this woman died? 
Karen shook her head in shock. No, this can't be, she exclaimed. I'm not dead. I'm right here. I do not know what's going on. Please help me. At least tell me where my family is, please. I can't contact anyone. Well, miss, I don't know where Mr. Anderson is now, but I understand he moved out of town after his divorce. I know for a fact that his former in-laws died shortly after Mrs. Anderson's body was found. Oh my God, no, please. Please tell me my parents are still alive, she begged through tears. I'm sorry. If you really are Mrs. Anderson's ex, and I'm not ready to admit it, then I can't honestly tell you about it, he said, sending Karen into hysterics. Miss, I think you need professional help. I'm going to call the County Behavioral Center and have you move to their facility until we get this all figured out, he said, pulling out his phone. Karen shook her head. No, please don't do this. I do not know what's going on. You have to believe me. Just let me talk to my husband. I can't do this, ma'am. I don't even know who you really are. You look like the late Mrs. Anderson. You dress like her. You seem to know some intimate details of Mrs. Anderson's life. You even drove Mrs. Anderson's car, although I'm not sure how you managed to start it after sitting there for so long. By the way, the registration plates on this car expired a while ago, so we will impound it until you can prove ownership and update the registration. Right now, I think you need to discuss this with a mental health professional. Please stay here, he said as he walked out the door. Karen laid her head on the table, sobbing. This shouldn't have happened, she thought. Of course, her husband will come and save her. The door opened and two large men in strange clothes entered the room. As they began to put it on her, Karen realized she was being put in a straitjacket and began to struggle. No, no, please don't do this to me, she said. No, no, oh, no, she screamed again and again. But the men continued to put clothes on her until she could no longer move her arms. No, she screamed as one of the men injected something into her neck. In a few seconds, her world plunged into darkness. Thursday, May 12th. 2016, 11.30 a.m. Wake up, dear, said a male voice. Wake up. Are you okay? Karen, wake up. Karen slowly opened her eyes and saw her husband's face. Karen, you had a nightmare, but it's over. Wake up, darling, he said. As Karen's mind slowly shook off the dream, she realized she was in her bed with her husband, Kyle. She instantly threw her arms around his neck and covered his face with kisses. Oh my God, Kyle, is that really you? She asked. Of course, silly. Who else could be in our bed? He asked. Hold me, Kyle, please, she cried. I missed you so much. Kyle hugged his crying wife as tightly as he could. He loved hugging this beautiful woman. But, he thought, what the hell is she talking about? I'm right here, he said. I'm not going anywhere. You better not go anywhere, she said. Having calmed down a little, Karen looked at her husband. Kyle, she said, I have something to confess, and I'm afraid you might get really angry with me. He looked at her with concern. Kyle, I almost made a terrible mistake, she said. Almost? he asked. Kyle, please don't hate me, but I have to tell you this. You know, we promised to never keep any secrets from each other, no matter how bad they were. Yes, dear, I know. You can talk to me about anything. You know that, right? He asked. Karen nodded. Yes, I know, but it's really bad. Have you met my boss, John Hawkins? Kyle knew him well. They met at a law firm's Christmas party, and Kyle could tell he was a classy asshole who considered himself God's gift to the female sex. Essentially, a legend in his own imagination. He could also tell that John was trying to stick his hooks and his private parts, into Karen. Yes, I remember him well, said Kyle. He's been trying to get me to stay after work for a long time, except he doesn't want to work if you know what I mean, she said. You mean he wants to get under your skirt, Kyle said. I can understand that. You are a beautiful, sexy woman. What man in his right mind wouldn't want to have sex with you? If we weren't married, I'd be flirting with you myself. What I don't like is the fact that he knows you're married. Yeah, well, he wanted me to meet him at a motel for sex, she said, looking down. Oh, really? 
Kyle said, his mood darkening. And you agreed? No, not really, she said. But in fact, I didn't disagree with it either. I just kind of blew him off. But he expects me to meet him tomorrow. I can't do it, but I'm afraid it will affect my work if I don't do it. Well, I can assure you that it will affect our marriage if you do this. And yes, it could also affect your job, Kyle said. You know that I will not tolerate infidelity, and your company has strict rules prohibiting adultery. You could both be fired, and yes, I would file for divorce. I know, she said. I haven't done anything with him yet, but I'm afraid. I know he's been with a lot of other girls in the office, and they all say he's a nice guy who uses weed to get his way. You believe me, don't you? Of course I believe you, Kyle said. You forget that we have been married for ten years, and before that we knew each other for five years. You've never been able to keep anything a secret from me, and the guilt will eat you alive. While we're on the subject, I notice that you've been a little out of sorts the last couple of days. At first I thought it was just work-related, but now I think I know the real reason, right? Karen lowered her eyes and nodded her head. Yes, she said quietly. I've been thinking a lot about this for the last two days. I don't want to lose my job, but I couldn't live without you, and I couldn't live with myself if I hurt you and the kids like that. What should I do? You're kidding, right? asked Kyle. You are a smart, educated woman, Karen. Do you really have to ask, or do you want me to spell it out for you? You don't have to do this, Kyle. I guess I just needed some validation. I know what I'll do first, she said getting out of bed. She went to her closet and pulled out a dress that she intended to wear the next day. It was a beautiful dress with slight cleavage and falling a few inches above the knees. It wasn't overtly sexy, but it still showed off her curves well. She pulled it out of the closet and threw it in the trash. I never want to see that dress again, she said. Kyle looked surprised. It was quite an expensive dress, he said. Are you sure you want to do this? Karen sat down on the bed. Yes, she said. And tomorrow I'll tell John. Not just no, but damn no. Then I'm going to ask for a transfer to another department. Maybe my salary will be cut, but I don't care. If they don't give it to me, I'll quit. Our marriage is more important to me, and I will do everything to keep us together. Can you ever forgive me? Of course I can, Kyle said. I'm a little mad that you didn't tell that bastard no right away, but at least now you're doing the right thing. Karen hugged her husband as if her life depended on it. I can't believe I was so stupid, Kyle. Please hug me and tell me you love me, she said. Kyle hugged her back and kissed her forehead. Of course I love you, Karen, and always have, he said. But I think we need to have a serious talk about this after you settle down, maybe even get some counseling. I can't believe you were so trusting that you fell in love with him like that. I understand. Karen said. I promise that this will never happen again. She looked at the TV on the wall opposite their bed and saw him, the man she had seen on the street corner in her nightmare. Kyle, who is that man on TV? She asked. This is Rod Serling, honey. They're having a Twilight Zone marathon. Why did you ask? I saw him before, but I didn't know who he was, she said. How is this possible? He died back in 1975, Kyle said. He was in my nightmare. He didn't actually do anything. He just stood there and watched. It was black and white, just like on TV, and it was just, I don't know, weird, she said. Interesting, said Kyle. Someday you will have to tell me about this dream. Kyle got out of bed and headed towards the door. I'll go downstairs and get myself something to drink. Do you want anything? Coca-Cola? Water? I would like some water, please, she said. After Kyle left the bedroom, Karen thanked the heavens for the dream she had. She suddenly realized that she had almost entered the twilight zone of betrayal. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.